Good morning. I am Heath Garris, in case I haven't had a chance to meet you. I'm from the biology department. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Van Dyke on behalf of our campus community and especially on behalf of the Campus Stewardship Committee. In case you didn't know, uh, the CSC organizes recycling for the campus as well as uh, facilitates opportunities to engage in conversations about thoughtful environmental stewardship, of which this talk is one. Um, so our speaker today is Dr. Fred Van Dyke. Uh, he comes from the Asabel Institute in uh, northern Michigan uh, with campuses around the world. Um, and Asabel's mission is to explore the wonders of God's world and the challenges of caring for creation in a faithful way. Uh, before his position at Asabel, Fred was the chair of the biology department at Wheaton. Uh, and he is a prolific writer. He's published the premier textbook in conservation biology, which I use in my course. And he's also published extensively on creation care as a covenantal discipline. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fred Van Dyke. Thank you for that wonderfully enthusiastic welcome. I've already been introduced once today, the day after Halloween, as a treat. And that's better than the alternative. It's a privilege to be in this magnificently beautiful chapel of yours. And what a pleasure to speak about God's creation on a campus that can see more of it than any campus in America. And what a pleasure to speak about what the Bible tells us about our life and our work in his great world. Let me take you for a moment away from this beautiful campus to another campus, this one in Indonesia. And I'm going to take you into a class. This is a class at an orangutan orphanage. Now, why do we have orangutan orphanages? Because we have orangutan orphans. In Indonesia, this is a major problem, and all orangutans live there. There's between two and 3,000 of these orphans, which is a lot because there are only 50 to 60,000 orangutans in the whole world. In Indonesia, if you have a gun, and you're a good shot, and you can go into the forest and find a nursing mother orangutan with her infant, you shoot the mother, she falls out of the tree, and if the infant is not killed, it's easy to capture, and you can put it in a cage and sell it as a pet. And in doing that, you may make thousands of dollars, more than you could make in a year doing many other kinds of things in Indonesia. This practice is illegal, but it's still very common. And the authorities every year rescue, we could say redeem, thousands of these infant orangutans from this slave trade. But doing that only solves half the problem. An infant orangutan is like an infant human being. It doesn't know anything. Orangutans are like us in this way. They don't live by instinct. They live by learning. And as a result, to learn to live, they will stay with their mother for eight to nine years before they go off on their own. So you can't simply take the infant orangutan, put it in a tree and say, good luck kid, see you later. A motherless infant orangutan is certain to die. Now, the Bible teaches us five great ideas, what I would call the intellectual pillars of a biblical creation ethic that help us to understand our work in creation as part of our vocation of our life in Christ. And I call these ideas pillars because pillars are things that hold other things up. Pillars are things that can bear the weight of something that weighs even more than they do. And these pillars can wear, bear the weight of big ideas and even bigger 
things than the ideas themselves, the way you can use and apply them. And all five of these ideas that I'm going to talk to you about are present in this picture of Wewick and her students. Now let me tell you about who's in this picture. Two five to six year old female orphan orangutans, Betty with her back to the camera, Sirius facing us, spelled like the radio network. And the woman in the red bandana is Wewick. And Wewick is a teacher at this orphanage. We're gonna come back in a moment to what Wewick is teaching, but first, we want to answer an important question, especially for education majors. Why devote yourself to teaching an orangutan? We find this answer in the Bible from the very beginning of what is written. The Bible's not a book of environmental ethics. It's a book by God, about God, written that we might know, understand, and love God. But interestingly, the very first thing that God reveals to us is not only something about himself, but something very important about his world. So, the first book, the first chapter, the first verse begins with words very familiar to all of you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. If you keep on reading, you will encounter that same six-word phrase, God saw that it was good, six times in the first 25 verses. It's applied to inanimate objects, like sun, moon, stars, land, water. It's applied to plants. It's applied to animals, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, and even the creepy crawlies, the things that creep on the face of the earth. Good, 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 good. God saw that it was good. And we know from this context that this is not an instrumental goodness because there are no human beings present to use the creation at this point instrumentally, and God himself has no instrumental needs that can be met by his created order. This is an intrinsic goodness, a goodness that is a goodness of the thing itself, a good of its own, which is unique to that creature and a good which is not the same as our good. And so, in these very first verses of Genesis, God accomplishes what it sometimes takes ethicist whole chapters to accomplish. He establishes creation's moral standing, its moral value. This is a good world. Now, the fact that something has moral standing, moral value, doesn't tell us how we ought to treat it. And that is our second big biblical idea. That is a pillar of moral agency. How do we respond when we're faced with the moral value of the creation around us? And the Bible tells us almost immediately, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to serve it and to protect it. Now, perhaps you've heard the last two verbs of Genesis 2.15, translated till and keep. The words in Hebrew are abad and shamar. Those words are more literally translated, and when they occur elsewhere in Scripture, they usually are translated, serve and protect. Choose for yourselves this day, Joshua says to the elders of Israel, whom you will abad. But as for me and my house, we will abide the Lord. The Lord bless you and shamar you. The opening words of the great benediction of Numbers 6. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. This is the original human vocation. This is the Bible's prescription for the right response to his good creation. 
But prescription is not the same as enablement. To enable human beings to carry out this great moral response, God provides them, provides us, with two additional attributes, capacity and authority. Let us make man in our image after our likeness, Genesis 1.26. Now in the ancient world, people who first heard or read these words would not think of an image so much as in terms of physical resemblance as they would think of it as the physical representation of another by means of the physical presence of the image. And so it was in these cultures that kings would erect images of wood and stone of themselves and place them in their kingdoms, particularly at their borders, in order that those who saw those images might understand this very clear message of the king. I am not physically present here, but you stand in this place under my authority. This is my realm. And so God makes human beings to be the representation of him to creation. And the reality of this capacity is very easy to prove. Let's go back to see how it works itself out at the orangutan orphanage. I promised earlier I'd explain what this class is about, what Betty and Sirius and Wewick are doing here. What is today's lesson? Today's lesson is how to open a termite mound and extract the termites to get something to eat. Mm-mm, good. Now, the three participants have a great deal in common. They are all highly intelligent. As you can see from the picture, they are also all highly engaged in today's lesson. Nobody's looking at their cell phone in this class. And they are all highly motivated they want to achieve the solution. But for all their similarity, there is a great gulf of difference between them. For all their intelligence, engagement, and motivation, Betty and Sirius can never see this problem from any perspective except the perspective of an orangutan. Wewick, on the other hand, must see this problem from a perspective very different from her own. She must be what a psychologist would describe as a reflective interactant in this exchange. She must intentionally put herself into the feet, they don't wear shoes, of the orangutan and see this problem the way it appears to Betty and to Sirius if she is going to help them to solve it. Think about what this means. On all this great wide earth, there is only one species who cares about what happens to other species. There is only one species in the world that tries to protect endangered species, like orangutans. There is only one species on earth that worries about the effects its activities are going to have on other kinds of creatures, and that species is the human species. And this capacity is a manifestation of the image of God in you and in me. But Wewick has more than capacity to work with here. She also has authority to express that capacity in her care for Betty and Sirius. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them rule. I tell you the truth about these words. My non-Christian friends who are conservationists will say, that's the whole problem. That's the human justification for the exploitation of nature. 
you and I can understand where they're coming from because we have studied human history. And human history is full of rulers who use their authority to subjugate others in cruel and despotic ways. Even their names scream their injustices. Ivan the Terrible, Vlad the Impaler. Now there's authority at work. And Jesus' own disciples carried this same connotation of rule and authority with them. And for that reason, James and John, with the help of their mother, cook up a scheme to take the seats of authority at the right and the left hand of Jesus because they figure the kingdom is about to arrive any minute and this is their chance to subjugate everyone else, including the other ten disciples. No wonder when Peter and Andrew and all the rest get wind of this, a fight breaks out. Jesus puts an end to this quickly with these memorable words. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, not in my kingdom. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be everybody's slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And in this statement is not only the heart of creation care, but the heart of the gospel itself. Now, to understand the connection between Genesis and Jesus, between Genesis and the Gospels, the simplest form of logical argument we can use is what we call a tautology, a form of argument which, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true by the force of logic alone. Here's the simplest tautology I know. Premise one, A equals B. Premise two, B equals C. Now, if you've been waiting, this is the audience participation part. We're going to do the conclusion together. And please give me some volume on this. The inescapable conclusion of our tautology is, ready? A equals C. This is a great college. That is a conclusion that the premises force us to accept. Now, in Jesus' words and Genesis' words, we face a biblical tautology that contains the great revolution of the gospel. In creation, human beings are rulers of creation. That is premise one. And our second premise, in the word of Jesus Christ himself, rulers express their authority by their service to their subjects, bringing us to this inescapable conclusion that human beings rule creation through their service to their fellow creatures. And when we see this conclusion, Genesis 2.15 now makes perfect sense. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to serve it and to protect it. Now all four of these pillars that we've covered so far are in that one picture of Wewick and Betty and Sirius, but that's four pillars, not five. And the last great idea, perhaps the greatest of all, is the pillar of significance, which comes through redemptive hope. For the anxious longing of creation, Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome, waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free into the freedom of the glory of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. That tells us 
that the non-human creation is part of God's redemptive plan and purpose. But it does not tell us there how it will become part of God's redemptive plan and purpose. Paul will explain that in his letter to the Christians at Colossae. By him, all things were created in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now in that doxology of praise to Jesus Christ, you may have noticed there's a recurring two-word phrase. And in English, it's always translated all things, because in Greek, it's always the same two words, tapanta. And Paul's argument runs in this logic, Jesus Christ created all things. Jesus Christ sustains and holds together the all things, the tapanta he created. And Jesus Christ reconciles all the things he created and sustains through, in Paul's words, the blood of his cross. This is the victory of Good Friday. God has included all of his creation in his redemptive plan and purpose, and God is going to have his kingdom, heaven, which is his space, merge with our space, which is earth, destroying once and for all every form of idolatry and slavery and corruption and bondage which binds us today and which binds this creation as well. The Bible scholar N.T. Wright, in his latest book, The Day the Revolution Began, puts it this way, that God has not offered us in the Bible a covenant of works, but a covenant of vocation. The main task of this vocation is image-bearing, reflecting the Creator's wise stewardship into the world and reflecting the praises of all creation back to its Maker. You can put your weight on these biblical ideas and you can act them out consistently by doing three things in your vocation as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You can first make an informed study of God's creation. Whether you're a biology major or something else, your class in biology, your class that you have to take in general education and environmental science could change your life if you value its lessons as much as Betty and Sirius valued the lessons they gained from Wewick. You can learn what creation really is. The second thing you can do is practice deliberate contact with that creation. And what a great place you have to do it here. Every day, you could walk a few steps and be in this forest around you. You could put out your hand and touch what God has made today. You could see it with your own eyes. And finally, you can choose to exercise sacrificial concern because you possess, in your present condition, the resources, the strength, the time, the energy, the effort, and yes, even the money that you can use to exercise for the good of other creatures. You can learn how to make a place for them in the world. You can aid those who are called to do this every day of their life and work. You can encourage by works and gifts those who work to bless the life of creation and all its creatures. 
and these opportunities are all around you. Let no one fail to see them because of a hard heart, a heart whose soil is rocks or weeds or road pavement, but rather a heart that is good soil and out of which can grow up great fruit for the care of God's creation. I won't tell you exactly what is the right thing to do. I will tell you simply that these are three ways to think about what you should do so that you can do the right thing. God's kingdom is coming. His redeemed creation will be part of that kingdom. And its redemption is part of your vocation. We give thanks to you, O Lord, with a whole heart for all that you have done for us through what you have made. Your creation stains us, sustains us in food and drink and the air we breathe and sustains us in joy in the lives of creatures you permit us to see that live about us. And I pray, Father, that more and more, even as Covenant College can see more of your creation than any other campus, so let it also care for all that it can see. We give you thanks for your care for us, your redemption of us, through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. In his name, we pray and ask these things. Amen.